We're going to finish up chapter 8 covering section 6 and 7 on the conservation of energy. Okay, so let's first talk, let's talk about work done on a system by an external force. Now, work is energy transferred to or from a system by means of an external force acting on that system. All right, so um, in previous problems, we've, we've used systems of objects before, but we ne didn't necessarily define what a system is. Um, so for instance, a system is going to be the objects that were, are really involved in the problem. So for instance, if you have um, a block that's you know, maybe falling down to the earth, the system is just going to really include that block. But let's say this block was connected to um, another block, then both blocks are going to be in that system. Um, <clears throat> when you do positive work to a system, to a group of objects, um, you're giving those objects energy. So you're going to increase the amount of energy the objects have. Okay, so positive work is going to increase the amount of energy. Now, if you do negative work to a system, you're going to decrease the amount of energy that the system has. Okay. Um, so let's look at two different instances, one when friction is involved and then one when friction is not involved. All right, so we're going to start with our equation for work. We know that work is going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. We've seen this equation before. So really what this means is work is equal to the change in mechanical energy. Um, you're, so in this example, your lifting force transfers energy to kinetic energy and potential energy. All right, so for instance, if we're looking at a system, and in the system we're including the ground, which is going to be the earth, and a ball that's above it. If we do work to that ball against the gravity, we're going to be adding kinetic energy to the system, right? And we're actually also going to be adding potential energy. <clears throat> so the positive work is done on a system of a bowling ball and the earth, causing a change in mechanical energy in the mechanical energy of the system. A change in, or, um, a change in kinetic energy in the ball's kinetic energy and a change in you in the in the um, in the system's gravitational potential energy. All right, so as you raise the ball, you're both giving it potential, and if you're applying a force and it's accelerating, then you're going to be increasing its kinetic energy as well. Okay, um, now friction involved. So what if we have friction? Well, we have a force applied, and then there's going to be some opposing force, which we're going to call friction. Right, we set that equal to ma. This just comes from our right net force is equal to ma. All right, so our two forces are now acting. One is the applied force, and then one is some frictional force that's going to be opposing it. All right. Now we know that the work done is is just going to be fd. Right, this is just the work done, and <clears throat> that's going to be the change in kinetic plus the frictional force times the distance, right? So really just looking at the work done by both of these forces sort of added together, right? Because the work, actually the work done is going to be both of those forces. So over some distance we can see individually what the what the contribution is. Um, so coming down here we have our, our work done by the actual force and then Change in kinetic energy is just going to be the change in mechanical energy as long as the potential is not changing. And then the force of kinetic friction over some distance. All right, so the applied force supplies energy and the frictional force transfers some of it into thermal energy. All right, so you're getting some amount of energy from the actual force, but then some of the energy is getting transferred into what we're going to call thermal energy. So the work done by the applied force goes into kinetic energy and also thermal energy, right? And that's kind of what this, this equation says. So the work done by the applied force equals some change in kinetic energy plus some change in, uh, or some addition of thermal energy from the friction, All right? And for therm thermal energy, we're just going to use the change or the delta, uh, delta E and then TH to signify that that's thermal energy. Okay, so let's go do an example problem. Um, 
we're looking at the change in thermal energy. So a food chipper pushes a wood crate of cabbage heads, total of a mass of 14 kilograms, across a concrete floor with a constant horizontal force of 40 newtons. All right, so our applied force is going to be 40 newtons in a straight line distance displacement of magnitude 0.5 meters. So there's our distance. The speed of the crate decreases from 0.6 meters a second to 0.2 meters a second. Right, so as you're applying this force, its speed is actually going to be decreasing. How much work is done by the force, and on what system does it do work to? So what, what, you know, what is the actual system, what is the group of objects? Okay, so because the applied force is constant, we can calculate the work um, it does by using our equation here. Right, work is equal to force times the cosine of theta. <clears throat> Now substituting given data, including the fact that the force um, and the displacement are in the same direction, we simply find that our, so our work is equal to F D cosine theta. And by the way, let me just point out, they're using the variable phi here, a lowercase phi. I usually just use theta when we're talking about angles, so I'll go ahead and use the theta. Um, this is equal to... 40 newtons times our distance, which we know is 0 0.50 meters, times the cosine of our angle, which is 0 degrees, because they're both going in the same direction. All right, so putting that into a calculator, we get just 20 newtons, right? Just 0.5 times 40. Okay, so this is the amount of work being done by that force. Now, we can determine the system on which um, the work is done to see which energies change because the crate speed changes there is certainly going to be some change in kinetic energy of uh, yeah some delta k in the, in the crate's kinetic energy now if there's friction between the floor and the crate and thus a change in thermal energy um, note that the force and the crate's velocity have the same direction so thus if there's no friction then the force should be accelerating the crate to a greater speed and it's not right we know that it's slowing down so there must be friction and some change in thermal energy of the crate and the floor therefore the system on which the work is done is the crate floor system because both energy changes occur in that system right if you said it was just the crate Right, so let's just kind of look at this quickly. If you had you know, a crate on a floor, if you said that the system was just the crate, you're not going to be able to include the friction force with the floor, right? Because that's between the floor and the crate. So that would actually be an external force, an additional external force. Um, it would not be included in the system. So we need to actually include the floor so that we include this frictional force as well. Okay, so what the, the last part is, what is the increase in thermal energy of the crate and the floor? All right, we're going to start with our equation for work, which is the change in mechanical energy plus the change in thermal energy, right? So we're adding on this change in, oops, this change in thermal as well. Basically, this is going to include all the different types of energy. So we know that this change in mechanical is going to be your change in kinetic plus your change in potential. And then we also have the change in thermal. All right, and that's going to be equal to... The work done. Okay, so we're really trying to find what this change in thermal energy is, right? Like how much is the thermal energy uh, changing? All right, so first thing, we know that um, our mechanical energy in this case is just going to be kinetic, right? There's no there's no potential energy, there's no spring, there's no gravi gravity that we're talking about here, so you don't have to worry about the potential. Um, we know that our change in kinetic energy is just going to be one-half final velocity uh, oops, minus one half the initial velocity one has m times the initial velocity squared right just one it's just our change in kinetic energy here right um, so since we know our change in kinetic we can go ahead and plug this into our original equation up here and solve for thermal energy right so the thermal energy or the change in thermal energy is going to be equal to the work done which we already found in the previous part right that was 20 joules minus our change in kinetic, so that's one-half mf squared, or mvf squared, excuse me, minus one-half mv naught squared. Okay, and then simplifying this, this is just the work minus one-half mvf squared minus 
v naught squared. I just pulled out the one half m and distributed that out. Okay, so plugging in numbers, we have 20 joules, which is the work that we found in the previous section. One half times the mass, which is 14, oops, 14 kilograms. Times our changes in velocity, so you have 0 0.20 meters a second squared minus 0 0.60 meters a second squared. Right? And then solving this out, you just get 22.2 .2 joules. Right? So you end up with 22.2 .2 joules of thermal energy, right? which means we're sort of um, so a lot of the energy that the system had, that the object had itself, was actually going to be turned into thermal energy throughout the while it's being pushed. Okay. So the last uh, section covers just a general overview of conservation of energy. Right now we're including all the different types of energies that we could possibly have. So the total energy of a system can change only by amounts of energy that are transferred to and from the system, where the mechanical energy is any change in the mechanical energy of the system, um, ETH is going to be any change in thermal, and then EINT is going to be any change in any other type of internal energy in the system, what, you know, whatever that might be. Now, the total energy of an isolated system cannot change, right? So the work done is going to be zero to that. Okay, so we're really looking at, is this an isolated system that we're dealing with, right? Or is there some external force acting on the system itself? Um, when you're looking at this equation here, this can also be written as, um, let's just put it up here. This is going to be energy, let's just say at point one, is going to be energy at point two. And this could be at any two points in, in the problem. It doesn't have to be the beginning and the end. It can be really any middle points. Um, it doesn't really matter. So for instance, like if I had, let's just say I had a roller coaster that kind of looked like this. Let's say we knew how much energy was here and I wanted to find how much energy was here. I can do that, you know, as long as I knew what the height is here, right? Or I could pick these two points or I could pick these two points. It doesn't really matter which two points. You want to pick points that are convenient, you know, where you know some of the information. Um, okay, so... I can write, rewrite this equation as the total energy at one point is equal to the total energy at another point. And at each point, they're going to have, there's going to be potential for mechanical energy, thermal energy, and internal energy. All right, so I could write that as our, let's just say our kinetic energy one plus our potential energy. Um, let's say this is going to be our potential of a spring one. And this is going to be the potential of gravity. Oops, one. Right? And then we have some, let's say, thermal energy here. And then there's some, some other kind of additional internal energy. Right? All at point one. Right? And then you just set that equal to the same thing, but at point two. So you have kinetic energy at two, plus you have spring potential at two, plus you have gravitational potential at two, plus you have some thermal energy at two, plus you have some internal energy at two. Now, in most cases, when you're solving problems, a lot of these might cancel out, right? You might not actually have kinetic energy and spring potential and gravitational potential, right? But if you start, you can always start problems like this and then just cancel out the things that you don't need, that you know aren't there. Um, this is a really easy way to kind of set up the problems, right? And you can then start plugging what you know. So, you know, kinetic energy is gonna be one half mv1 squared, you know that your spring potential um, is going to be 1 half kx squared. You know that your gravitational potential is going to be mgh at point 1, and that's at x1. All right, so then you can sort of break that down even more, plug in all the equations, and really solve for what you're trying to find. Okay. All right, so the last uh, little bit here is talking about external forces and then internal energy transfers, right? So we mentioned internal energy in the last slide. Let's maybe look at it a little bit closer. All right, so looking at our skater here, her push on the rail causes a transfer of internal energy to kinetic energy, right? So she's going to push off a wall here at some angle here. That's where the angle of the force, and we know that 
there's an equal and opposite force. There's She's putting force um, on to the wall, and the wall is acting back on her with an equal and opposite force. And this actually transfers the energy that she had in her hand, that she was pushing from her hand, into her own kinetic energy. So it's actually an internal energy in this case when you just look at her as the system. All right, so let's go through this. As the skater pushes herself away from a railing, the force on her from the railing is going to be F. After the skater leaves the railing, she has some velocity. External force F acts on the skater at an angle of phi with a, hor with, with a horizontal axis. And when the skater goes through a displacement D, her velocity is changed from 0 to some velocity by the horizontal component of F. Right, so in some very small distance here, she's actually going to be applying a force to herself as she's getting pu pushed backwards. So the energy that she had is actually being transferred from, let's say, maybe potential energy into some kinetic energy. All right, so an, an external force can change the kinetic energy or potential energy of an object without doing work on the object. That is, without transferring energy to the object, right? So in this case, no no one's doing work on her, right? There was nothing. There's no work being done um, when when because she, the energy was being transferred from herself to herself, basically, right? Um, so instead, the force is responsible for transfers of energy from one type to another inside the object. Okay. Um, Let's talk about power. So in general, power is the rate at which energy is transferred by a force from one type to another. So in an amount of energy, E is transferred in an amount of time, T, the average power due to this force, is going to be right, just our change in energy over some change in time. Right? And this is also equal to the work done in some change in time, right? because the change in energy is the work. Okay. Now, if you're looking at an instantaneous moment, we know that we can just l create some very small amount of time, dt, and that'll give us the small amount of energy that's being transferred or, transferred, or the work that's being done in a small amount of time. So this really just turns into a derivative for us. All right. So really, it's the derivative of the energy, right? the amount of energy being transferred in a specific amount of time. You know, this is a rate. Okay. So let's do a sample problem. Now in the figure, a two kilogram package of tamales slides along a floor with a speed of V1 is equal to four meters a second. It then runs into and compresses a spring until the package momentarily stops. Its path to the initial relaxed spring is frictionless, but as it compresses the spring, a kinetic frictional force from the floor of magnitude 50 newtons acts on the package, right? So while it's sliding over here, there's no friction, but as soon as it hits the spring, it's going to have some rough surface, so it's going to actually have some friction over here. Now, if the spring constant is 10,000 newton meters, by what distance d is the spring comp compressed when the package stops? So we're trying to figure out what this distance is that the spring is compressed when the package stops. Now it says, during the rubbing, kinetic energy is transferred to potential energy and thermal. Right, so you're taking the kinetic energy of this package, and it's being transferred into the potential of the spring and uh, the frictional thermal energy that's being given off as it's rubbing against the floor. Right, so this is all included in our system. All right, so some, some, some key ideas. So the normal force on the package from the floor does no work on the package. Right, the normal force is, in, remind you, is up in this direction. Right? And then the gravitational force is down in this direction. But this is going to be perpendicular to the actual motion of, of the object. And we know that work is Fd cosine theta, cosine of 90. If we had a 90 degree angle here, because right, this is our displacement vector, um, the cosine of 90 would be 0. So we wouldn't have any work being done by either the normal force or the force due to gravity. Now, as the spring is compressed, the spring force does work on the package. And the spring force also pushes against a rigid wall, right? So it's pushing to the right. It's also pushing back to the left on the wall. So there's friction between the package and the floor. And the sliding of the package across the floor increases their thermal energies. So the system. This, the system is going to be the package, the spring, the floor, and the wall. 
and it includes all of these forces and energy transfers in one isolated system. All right, so remember when we said we had an isolated system, you could take um, some amount of total energy at one point is equal to some amount of total energy at a second point. You can break that into mechanical and thermal, right? And then eventually you can just rearrange and get to this equation and see what the change, or excuse me, what the mechanical energy is at point two. Um, okay, so let's start filling some stuff in. Um, in the equation, let's let the one subscript correspond to the initial state of the sliding package and subscript two correlate to the state in which the package is momentarily stopped and compressed. Right, so this is going to be point one and then when it's compressed, it's going to be point two. Um, for both states, the mechanical energy of the system is the sum of the package's kinetic energy and the spring's potential. Right, because mechanical is potential and kinetic. So for state one, we know that our potential is going to be zero, right, because the spring is relaxed, and the package's speed is going to be v1. All right, so if we just look at the mechanical energy one, it's going to be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at one. So that's just going to be one half mv squared plus zero. Now if we look at the mechanical energy at two, this is 1, this is 2. We know that it's going to have some kinetic plus potential. And actually, it doesn't have kinetic, right? Mechanical energy would have kinetic, but since it's momentarily stopped as it's compressed, it would have 0 kinetic plus its potential, which is going to be 1 half k d squared. All right, this is the potential from the spring. Now I take these two results and plug it back into our original equation. So we know that we get 1 half kd squared is equal to 1 half mv, and it's going to be v1 squared, right, minus some frictional force times the distance. Right? This, is, this is the thermal energy. This frictional force times distance is our change in thermal energy. All right, at this point, you can just plug in values. Right? So you plug in our spring constant, which was 10,000, divide that by 2, so you have 5,000 times d squared, and set this equal to, we have 1 half mv squared here, so we know that the mass is 2 kilograms, the velocity is 4 meters a second, squared that would be 8, and then you divide that all by 2, you just get 16, so this is going to be, uh, let's see, this would be 16. Right. And the last one, the force of friction times the distance. Well, we know that the frictional uh, force is going to be 15 newtons, so this is just going to be minus 15 times d. Okay? What you, you notice is we end up with a quadratic equation. We have d squared, we have a d, and then we have a constant. So rearranging this into the correct form, we have 5,000 d squared plus 15d minus 16 is equal to 0. And you can use your favorite method for solving a quadratic, whether it's the quadratic of formula or your calculator. You get d is equal to 0 0.055 meters. And that is your solution for the distance. All right, that is it for this lecture. We will pick it up next chapter.